Who did it? Which one of you did this? Who told TikTok about GPT-3? Anyone out there want to speak up? For what's going on right now? Chris billion dollar business using ChatGPT in three steps. Number one, you're gonna open ChatGPT on your phone. If you haven't seen ChatGPT three yet, this tool is literally going to change the world as we know it. If I don't use ChatGPT, I can't remember the powers of AI. Never mind, I'm gonna use ChatGPT. I'm Circa, this is Full Stack Creative, and welcome to our GPT three video. I promise you, it's gonna be way different than any other GPT three video that you've seen before. Well, let's get into it. So in 2020, GPT-3 comes out as the latest transformer model AI from OpenAI designed as a natural language processing solution. What does it do? It predicts text. How does it do it? First, OpenAI takes the entirety of the internet all of it, all the text that it could find, and then it trains a machine learning model on this text. So now the machine learning model is aware of all the text ever generated on the internet. And its job is to predict the next text given a prompt. The difference between this model and previous natural language processing models is that it has the ability to pay attention. And that is why it's known as a transformer model. But the day will never come that we forsake this planet. The T in GPT-3 is transformer, I believe. Generative pre-trained transformer. Okay, GPT-3 came out in 2020. That's when it was cool. But notice that it took until 2023 when with the release of like a slightly updated version of GPT-3 called GPT-3.5, OpenAI releases ChatGPT, which is like a simple app that allows you to interact with GPT-3 without having to like know it exists. And now everyone and their mother is talking about chat GPT, which is really just GPT 3.5 with a chat interface. People are saying oh my God, this is going to replace, you know, everything. On TikTok, the reaction was, uh, if you don't build a billion dollar business using chat GPT, you're Loser. So it's been a wide range of reactions to ChatGPT, but it's funny because you can kind of ignore reactions to ChatGPT and just look at reactions to GPT-3. It's essentially the same paradigm shift. It's just three years earlier and the commentary is all by nerds who actually know anything. But as a human being in the world, you probably are going to get assaulted by various opinions on what ChatGPT is and what it means and what you should do with it. So I want to just reply to the range of reactions that have come out about GPT-3. So the first one that, that kind of jumps off of the top of my mind is any reaction claiming that this thing is never going to replace real artists or real creativity or what have you. Who said uh, Nick Cave? Right. So someone used chat GPT to poorly create Nick Cave lyrics. And then Nick Cave got a hold of it and he was like, ah, this is rubbish or whatever the f he said. A grotesque mockery of what it is to be human. It's grotesque. I'm disgusted. Ugh. GPT-3 is not great at the nuances of poetry yet because its training set for truly great poetry is far lower than its training set for terrible poetry. Poetry is one of those things that has like a modified Pareto distribution where like 99% of the actual poetry that exists is terrible. You're not gonna very well replicate Shakespeare because there's not that much Shakespeare to actually try to replicate. Lyrics are pretty much poetry and even 99% of the lyrics that are popular are really bad. Magnus, how do they work? So your training set's even lower. You're gonna be more confused. There's more noise. You could have surmised that GPT-3 was not going to any day soon give you a Bob Dylan song that's like, wow, that's really good. Furthermore, you're removed from the context of like the music and how the lyrics are said. So I understand why someone would look at that and say like, oh, this is amateurish. But like, I've read Nick Cave lyrics. They're not that crazy. They're not that complex, dude. It's not like, uh, you know, he's writing like Seamus Heaney or any sh like that. He's writing like song lyrics. They're kind of basic from a linguistic perspective. That leads into this sort of, sort of whole camp of people who are like, it'll never do what Nick Cave can do. But it's like, it will. 
it's gonna. Any argument about how uh, there's something unique about human cognition that computation will never actually be able to achieve is, I think it's misguided because it, might, it may be the case that language isn't the most complex thing that we do. Language might be pretty simple compared to consciousness, basically like we all reconstruct some kind of hallucination of what the outside world might be like based on our sensory data. That's probably more complex. This crazy hallucination is more complex than like Nick Cave lyrics. So that might be the harder nut to crack when it comes to general AI than language. Language might be pretty, you know, rudimentary. I mean, chess, right? Chess is a very complex game. Go is many orders of magnitude more complex than chess and both of them have been cracked by AI. So these things that that people claimed that AI would never be able to beat them at has, you know, it's just consistently dominated. <laughs> it just stuffs, it takes it to the rim with anyone who says it'll never do X. And it does it very quickly, like years after they say that. Do you wanna be one of these people who said like the internet was a fad? Like you really wanna be on that side of history when you could have just not said anything? <laughs> it may be the case that this paradigm shift alone is sufficient to pass the Turing test. Turing test is described in many different ways, but it's basically like if you talk to an AI through like a chat application for long enough, would it convince you that it's a human? If so, it passes the Turing test. Chat GPT could probably pass the Turing test to some degree or another. If you think that there's something unique about human creativity, besides the fact that it's like meant to work on humans, like you don't, you don't judge a piece of artwork based on how a robot responds to it, you judge it by how a human reacts to it. If you think that AI is not going to create things that are more pleasing to, to humans than any human could create, you're fooling yourself, you're crazy. And this becomes very obvious when it gets to images. There's a novel way to take a bunch of noise and create an image from it. It's like sculpting with pixels. It's a very general uh, shitty description of what stable diffusion is. It uses noise to approximate an image and then it tunes its recognition of that image using GPT-3 uses natural language and terms that describe the image in order to get the final image that you're looking for. So you give it a prompt to spit you back out an image and it can do photographic images where you think this is a photograph somewhere. It can do images in any style from any artist of any person of anything you could describe. It can do it like that and it's really good. It's still not so great with knowing how many fingers a human is supposed to have or whether your arm's supposed to like stop right here. It's not great at that, but it already beats like almost all human photographers and human graphic artists. It beats them. It's better. It takes less time to do something that's as palatable to a human as anything they could do. So OpenAI had this project called Jukebox where they use the GPT-2 model to train on 1.2 million songs categorized by artists, album genre, year, moods, and keywords. So then they ask that model to spit out New new Frank Sinatra songs. Let's listen to that. It's Christmas time and you know what that means. Oh, it's hot tub time. As I like the tree this year, will be in a time. It's not perfect, but that was GPT-2 and it's pretty good. It spat that out. It doesn't have samples of like, you know, the instruments. It doesn't have like a way to generate the voice and then the piano and stack it. It just spits that out. So it doesn't have to construct like humans construct. Same way with drawings, it just spits it out. And how far away are we from a novel way to do that in which you get perfect new Elvis featuring Bob Dylan songs? What need w will there be for human creativity <laughs> when the, the audience on which the, the, the artwork is judged can get anything that they can describe like that and it's tuned to what they like. You take your Spotify data, your listening data, you give it to the AI, make me dream collabs from my listening history. You're not gonna care that it's not human. You're not gonna care and it's gonna be better. And so I don't think artists should like revolt against this cause like it's just inevitably gonna happen. Like I'm an artist too, I like making music, but like I'm not gonna let that cloud my, my awareness of what's going on. This is happening. What does it mean? Who knows? Like what are we gonna do? Who knows? But it's happening. Don't 
Don't put your head in the sand about it. So that's anyone who says like, it's not going to do what humans can do. It can't do what I can do. Like, you know, don't be so proud of yourself. Like it's probably going to do it really soon. The next reaction is like, this is a like kind of in the same vein is like, this is grotesque or this is like not human. You should really explore what human cognition may be. People like Yosha Bach and Michael Levin, who's a biologist, they argue, well, you know, probably computational. Like your brain's probably a computer. And the reason they say that is because computers use the section of mathematics that you can actually run without running into contradictions. There are many things in mathematics which you cannot prove but are true. And that leads into contradictions, things to do with infinities and recursive loops. And so, <laughs> so that's just to say that computation is the part of math that actually works in the universe. You can compute it. It can give you a result. And the point of all that, the reason I'm saying that is because if the universe is computational, what else could the brain be but computation? It's just computation. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a complex computation. It's wondrous. It's really cool. Wowee. But like to say it's, um, magical to say that, like, we're not going to get a computer to do it. The computer in your phone used to be the size of like a building, not a hundred years ago, not 60 years ago, anything related to that. Anything that's an information technology, it doubles <laughs> and it's going to keep doubling and keep doubling. Don't think that, that we won't have computers that are smarter than you and better at f rapping or like playing guitar than you do. They're going to be better. If you judge it based on how far away from you it is in terms of like its ability to be tactful and its execution of, of consciousness and cognition, it would be a grotesque mockery of what computation can achieve. The other argument is that, um, that you should create a business off of chat GPT or you should start integrating it into your work. It took a long time for the ability to communicate mobily for this to happen, right? It took a while. I don't think it's going to take so long to get to the iPhone, something approximating general artificial intelligence, something that can definitely make a song better than us and something that doesn't need us to prompt it to do something. The ultimate end state of all these technologies is not to have us prompt it to do something we want it to do. It won't need us in the equation at all. And it's not going to take long. And I think that's the much larger conversation that should be had about these technologies is like, what's the role? What, what are we going to do? <laughs> What's society going to be like when it's counterproductive for any human being to do any job like robotics and artificial intelligence could ideally replace labor. Robotics are already replacing doctors in a lot of ways. And then natural language processing can replace lawyers and marketers and artists and photographers, and videographers, you know, self-driving cars can replace trucking and the whole transportation industry. We're not far away from where the idea of like, I'm gonna have a business with GPT is a f***ing insane idea. What are you gonna add? You're gonna prompt it to like write better marketing copy? It's not what you should be thinking about primarily in response to this technology, I think. I think you should be thinking larger, which is like, who's going to reap the productivity gains in terms of profit? You know, a company makes thousand X productivity gain, people get fired, people lose their jobs, companies still making more money. Where's the money go? How do people make money when they're completely counterproductive to whatever tasks they can fulfill? I don't think that AI needs humans to uh, use it for business applications or it won't very soon. I hope that um, this video gives you some cool like lines of inquiry, right? You can pick apart some of the things I've said and go do your own research and like check it out because I think um, there's a lot of really cool stuff to learn about this. I highly recommend Yosha Bach, any interview you can find on YouTube with him, Lex Friedman, Theories of Everything. There's a lot of great podcasts with Yosha Bach. And if you can understand what he's saying, do it. Ray Kurzweil. Check out Ray Kurzweil if you want to know more about the accelerating curve of technology and how we might be at the knee of the curve where the doubling gets really intense. And that's why I think that we might not be far away from these crazy far off scenarios. So check out Ray Kurzweil, check out Yosha Bach, check out Michael Levin and listen to, you know, what they have to say. I, I've listened to probably every Yosha Bach interview like multiple times. And it's taken that long to just barely, you know, really wrap my head around some of the things he says, but it all has to do with this. It all has to do with artificial intelligence, computational philosophy, cognition, machine learning, stuff like that. And it might change your perspective on what 
GPT-3 means for all of us. It might give you uh, some cooler things to think about, but I gotta tell you, it will not be long before I am completely irrelevant to the whole process of making this video. I could ask an AI to do it and it would generate something way better than what you just watched, but it'll never edit like Michael Kessler. It'll never take that away I hope you enjoyed this video. Hope it was a cool detour from our normal, uh, t you know, subject matter. And uh, if you did like it and you're new here, like and subscribe. I try to put out a video a week. And I'll see you next week in next week's video. Peace out.